Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. And it's the holiday season, so we're going to be talking about one of the most important things to many of us at this time of year. Especially in a year as tumultuous, and in many ways heartbreaking, as this one. That thing, of course, is family. Many of us take this time of year to enjoy spending time with those closest to us. But in the middle of a global pandemic, it just isn't that simple anymore. And many of us are really feeling that strain. Not to mention how the festive season can exacerbate feelings of loneliness in people with poor relationships with their family. Or those with no family at all. But whether you're safely ensconced with those who mean the most to you, or your Christmas is looking a bit bleak this year, I hope you can take a moment to sit here with me and talk about the game we love. Or at least, love to hate. So without further ado, let's look at how Deborah Daylight's families and their relationships affect the game's story and characters. Almost every character is in some way connected and shaped by their family, with a few exceptions. Most notably some of the less morally grey killers like the Doctor or Freddy, whose lack of family serves to further dehumanise them. Or those for whom a family would not make sense in the first place, like Demogorgon and Pyramid Head. In many cases, these killers who do have families to speak of have them to thank for some sort of tragic backstory. Either they lost their family like the Huntress, the Nurse and the Wraith, or the family mistreated them and they got their revenge like the Trapper and the Hillbilly. But I'll be steering clear of many of these today, because while their families undoubtedly do shape the characters they become, their relationship is kind of one-sided a lot of the time. Because we're only showing one perspective, that of the killer in question, it can be hard to explore a family dynamic, when its primary purpose is to create a tragic backstory by severing it. So instead, I decided to take a look at the only families in Dead by Daylight where we have multiple perspectives to see them from. A family relationship is, by definition, reciprocal. So you should be able to see how each member of that family reflects on the behaviour of the other members. This leaves us with two families to explore in great detail. The Yamaoka family, represented in the game by Rin and Kazan Yamaoka, the spirit and the Oni, and the Deshay family, represented by Charlotte and Victor Deshay, better known as the twins. In both cases, there's a lot to talk about. So let's just get started on the new killers, the twins. First of all, I just want to get something out there now. Just because behaviour says Victor is not a baby, and will ban you from their Discord if you do, do not believe them. Just cool it, Zippy. You sit on a throne of lies. Honestly, while I will always call Victor a child because he died at or just over the age of five, Behaviour keeps insisting he's an adult, presumably for legal reasons. Which is so absurd that Behaviour's own employees have demonstrated that they're fooling nobody. Look at his add-ons and tell me that Behaviour didn't believe Victor to either be a baby or a very young child. A toy soldier, a toy sword a few inches long, baby teeth, all personal effects associated with a child about the age of seven or so. And a bottle of milk described as his meal? Or a rattle? Hell, even the assets for their power were called Little Brother until a community member suggested it be changed. There's no way on earth you can convince me the Victor was designed as anything other than a primary school aged child. At least, until Behaviour manages to convince themselves. And I know I'm not the only one. Yo, don't kick my... <laughs> brother. But that's beside the point. Charlotte and Victor Deshay are the closest family in Dead by Daylight, in more ways than one. Their lives are completely defined by each other. You cannot tell the story of Charlotte while leaving Victor out, and vice versa. In every possible meaning of the word, Victor is a part of Charlotte, and nowhere is that clearer than when Charlotte's left on her own after Victor's death. She could have tried to move on with her life, maybe had Victor's body removed from hers so she could live her own life and carve her own path in the world, but she refused. She was not prepared to continue her life without him. She was given the opportunity to choose her own destiny and become her own person, but her love for Victor was so strong that she turned it down. She rejected becoming her own person in favour of living as an extension of Victor, a walking memorial to him devoting herself to preserving his corpse. This not only prevented her from living her own life, but actively brought more hardship to an already difficult existence by continuing to draw the attention of both local populations and the Black Veil. This relentless oppression she experienced for the crime of loving her family too much has shaped her into the vengeful and bitter person she has become. On the flip side, Victor's belligerence comes across as totally unrelated to his own hardships, and as such ensures he has his own personality when compared to Charlotte. 
I'm not going to say he's in control, but I don't think a control dynamic exists between Victor and Charlotte. Their emotional connection is definitely asymmetrical. Victor cares a lot less about Charlotte's well-being than Charlotte does about Victor's. His adult descriptions and actions after his revival and separation suggest he is much more fiercely individualistic than Charlotte, despite his total physical dependence on her. There's no suggestion of an emotional reunion between the two siblings when Victor is pleased to wake back up and see his sister's face again, growing up after all this time. Instead, he runs off into the forest, as if he's ready to fight an enemy only he can see, with Charlotte trying her best to keep up with him. That aggression is consistent with the manner of his death, where he lashed out with the candelabrum in the Black Veil Sanctum, and was responsible for many deaths as well as the escape of his sister. Charlotte dedicated her life after Victor's death to ensuring the safety of his corpse, complete with a symbolic burial for him. But I don't think if the roles were switched, Victor would do the same thing. That's not to say he doesn't care about her, because I absolutely believe he does, and would fight to defend Charlotte to the bitter end. But Victor seems like he's got more of his own personality than Charlotte does. That actually does both Charlotte and Victor a service, since Victor's death allowed us to see Charlotte without him to complete her, which was honestly a really interesting storytelling decision to make. It also allowed Charlotte and Victor to have two distinct personalities, without undercutting the defining family bond they share. Charlotte is caring, self-sacrificing, and emotionally dependent on Victor to give her life purpose, while Victor is aggressive, boisterous, and physically dependent on Charlotte to sustain him. In this way, the Deshay twins are a well-built example of how to write a close family. They are both distinct people, who have discernible personalities and idiosyncrasies all to their own, but are united by a mutual love and codependency, which they direct to a common goal, protect each other, and destroy anyone who might separate them. But close family isn't the only kind of family present in Dead by Daylight. A distant family relationship is just as valid as a super close one and has just as much to analyse. Which brings us to the Japanese samurai bloodline of the Yamaokas. Unlike the twins, who lived their whole lives with each other and developed together as a result of that, Kazan Yamaoka and his great-great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter, Rin Yamaoka, never actually met, due to there being about 200 years difference between their lifetimes. But just because they never met, doesn't mean there's nothing worth comparing about the two of them. It is need to have to look at it a different way if you want to draw conclusions. Rather than looking at the relationship between Rin and Kazan in a more literal sense by how they act with each other in the same way that we did with the twins, we must look instead at the thematic relationship between the two. How the actions of Kazan Yamaoka change how we understand the actions of his descendant Rin, and vice versa. At first glance, Kazan seems to be very much his own man, with care for his family being an afterthought to him. I mean, the man killed his own father by smashing his head in with a cannibal. That's not exactly indicative of a strong family relationship. But if we look a little deeper, we can see that the concept of family and his duty to it is absolutely core to Kazan's outlook on the world, much more than the well-being of the actual individuals in his immediate family. We can see this if we look at how he acts to those closest to him. His father Renjiro and his son Akito. Renjiro is Kazan's father and the patriarch of the Yamaoka family. So you'd think Kazan, with his immense regard for status and hierarchy, would respect his father's wishes when Renjiro tried to push him away from the bloodthirsty attacks against the imposters that Kazan saw as an insult to the true samurai families. But Kazan ignored his father's pleas and exterminated whole villages in his desire to purify Japan indicating that the structures that allow his family to maintain their status are more important than Renjiro's instructions. His relationship with his unnamed wife and son Akito support this theory. The cracked Sakazuki implies that Kazan had social difficulties at best, and was abusive to his wife at worst. And the flavour text of Akito's crutch and child's wooden sword suggests that he was preparing Akito to follow the samurai life in his footsteps, and was viciously angry when his warrior's legacy was ripped out from under him. This is where the history of Rin Yamaoka, his descendant better known as the Spirit, comes in useful in understanding Kazan's perspective. The Yamaokas, once a samurai family with wealth, power and prestige, were driven to ruin over the years, to the point that Rin's father was begging for a promotion at work to care for his ailing wife and support his daughter. In Kazan's world, they should be at the top of the pecking order, and anything else is an insult to him. 
and the fate of Rin shows us what happens when that order is allowed to decay. Her existence validates his philosophy, displaying the strong thematic relationship between the Oni and the spirit. This relationship runs both ways, as her eventual fate mirrors Kazan's own history of bloodshed. While Kazan eventually killed Renjiro unknowingly, for getting in the way of his murderous rampage, Rin was killed by her father consciously, and is implied to have gotten her revenge and killed him in turn after death. Kazan was driven to the act he committed by a twisted sense of justice, as he sought to maintain the social order of the time, as the Yakuyoke talisman would suggest, and Rin's vengeance on her father is a more conventional manifestation of that justice. That would explain why the entity took her instead of her father like it was intending. It saw a reflection of the violent spirit of Kazan Yamaoka in Rin, and decided to have her follow in Kazan's footsteps and become a killer. This parallel would make a lot less sense if Rin was not the direct descendant of Kazan, presumably through Akito, since no other children of Kazana have been mentioned. The family bond means that thematic relationships are virtually unbreakable, and the Oni and the spirit are two sides of the same coin as a result. If they were just two random Japanese people with no connection to each other, then their portrayal would make a lot less sense, and they'd be much weaker characters. Behaviour knows this and is playing the connection between them for all they're worth, with little details like the Oni's roar being heard in Spirit's archive tome, and Rin's blade being a shattered version of Kazan's own katana, really rewarding those of us with an eye for detail. Side note on that last one, Rin's weapon was stated to have shattered on spilling the blood of her kin, but even though Kazan murdered Renjiro, his katana is still intact. This is where you can tell the narrative design team thought it through, because in Kazan's story, he kills Renjiro with his kanabu, a symbol of his nature as an oni, instead of the katana. Just goes to show how much they care about telling the story of the Yamaoka family. People wonder why I think the oni has the best lore in the game. In summary, behaviour is at their best when writing two members of the same family with strong thematic ties, since it allows each one to reflect on the other and cause their actions to be viewed in different lights. The idea of Victor being individualistic and protectively violent wouldn't work half so well if he didn't have Charlotte as his mirror image, who emotionally depends on him and would rather run from her problems than tackle them head on like Victor did by burning down the Black Veil Sanctum. Kazan and Rin Yamaoka take this to another level by retroactively explaining and justifying each other's actions and enhancing their believability by having the events of Kazan's life still be influencing Rin's seven generations down the line. And the best bit is that even though we're not killers in some game for an eldritch god's cruel entertainment, we can all understand that on a deeply personal level, because we've all got family of our own, and can appreciate how they've changed us, and we've changed them. So when you next see your family, however long that may be, whether it's in person or over the internet because COVID-19 is a piece of shit, pay attention to what they say, how they act. Little things only someone who knows them well could notice you might see bits of yourself reflected in them. The way they say a certain word, their response to a particular story or joke, the way they talk with their hands, or drum their feet on the floor when they're excited. And if you're looking for it, maybe you'll even start to see bits of them in yourself too. Have a wonderful holiday season, and I'll see you all next time. Alright, so that was my long-awaited video about um, twins, and my festive video for the year. My last video, the LED one, absolutely exploded. So thank you, all you newcomers, welcome. And uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed the stay here. But yeah, absolutely take a look through my older stuff if you haven't seen it. The next video is probably coming either in the, uh, the very end of the month or in the very new year. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And it'll probably be a review of the full tome. So all the stories have come out now that we've got all of them. I'll be having a read through them all and reviewing all the lore in it one character at a time. So if you're interested in that, please do uh, let me know in the comments. My next individual chapter review or killer review is going to be about Silent Hill. So that's going to come probably after the tome review, but it might come sooner because we've still got three more weeks left on this tome. So we'll see how it, how it spins out. So expect those two videos in the, in the uh, coming weeks, plus something else I'm working on, which hopefully is taking a while to make, but it will hopefully be worth the wait. So till then... Uh, thank you. I've been the I've been the law guy here at Pixelbush Entertainment, and good night to you all. Have a lovely holiday.